So today in the reading corner, we're talking to Jasmine de Bilan, author of Asher and the Spirit Bird, her debut novel, which received, as I'm sure you know, lots of critical acclaim and won the Costa Children's Book Award. Jasbinder joins us today to talk about her second novel, Tamarind and the Star of Ishtar. It's a family mystery set in the Himalayas in a landscape where magic seeps into the mists, the hills and the natural environment. Welcome, uh, Jasbinder. Hi, hi. Thank you for having me. It's uh, lovely to be here with you. I am so pleased to be talking about this story, which although it's set in the Himalayas in northern India. It's a story that had lots of resonances uh, for me. But before we begin, it would be lovely to know what inspired this particular story. Yeah, so um, this story was really inspired by my mum. My mum grew up in India and her own mother died when she was a baby and it was something that I think she felt a real loss all her life and in so many ways she was kind of always searching for her mum and it was something that she talked to me a lot about when we were growing up and so it was um, a theme that was always kind of like uh, traveling around in my mind and when I came to think about my second book Um, I kind of thought, well, you know, it would be really great to take this very, very real issue um, and and something that I kind of felt very close to and, and kind of explore it. So the actual heart of the story is very real and something that means a lot to me and to my mum. And then, uh, like I like to do then so the sort of the very kind of heart and nugget of the story is something real and then I kind of built around it an imaginary world kind of taking bits from my own background and then a lot of invented things and a lot of kind of what if questions so that that was kind of how the story came came to be. And what we have is a very compelling story that follows uh, uh, a young girl's quest, really, to discover um, her mother. Um, I wonder if you can set up the story for us without giving away too much, because obviously we want everybody to to read the story. Uh, But lead us into it. Yeah, sure. So it's about 11-year-old Tamarind, and Tamarind lives in Bristol with her dad. And she's never known very much about her mum. There's been this kind of wall of silence. And so for the very first time, her dad decides that he's going to take her to her um, mum's family who live in the Himalayas. And so she goes from Bristol to her grand family home for the very, very first time. And when she's there, there are lots and lots of surprises. And the very first surprise is the fact that this house that her mum was brought up in is huge grand uh, beautiful mansion in the middle of the Himalaya Um, and once she's there she discovers a magical garden a mysterious mountain girl and her monkey and finally she begins to uncover the family secrets surrounding her mum's death when Tamarind was a baby. It would be lovely at that point, I think, to hear a bit where Tamarind arrives at this estate, um, at this big house, because it really sets the atmosphere for us. Would you read some to us? Okay, yes, I'd love to. Here we go. The car doors wash open and a cold wind rushes in, blowing damp leaves into the car. Arjun sprints away up the steps to the house. Kamal following close behind. But something makes me hesitate. I hear music nearby, like a faint tune hummed on the wind, and I think I hear a word. Tamarind. I glance around into the shadowy garden, swallowing the cool night air. Who sang my name? Or was it just the wind? My heart begins to beat against my ribs. Aunt Simran cradles my arm as she guides me down from the car. Big jump, Tamarind, 
she says. Oh, you're shaking, poor Beta. It's been such a long journey. We need to get you inside. Come on. We walk slowly across the crunching gravel, Aunt Simran still holding my arm. It's dark, but the moon is bright and sheds its yellow light over the house. The domed turrets make it look almost like a palace. It sits high up on its mound, with the veranda running all around it and shutters pulled firmly across the windows. Can we stop a minute? I ask. What is it? Aunt Simran asks, pausing at my side. I strain my eyes towards the gardens that drop away steeply and surround the house. The huge mountains loom in the distance like a barrier against the world beyond. And I can't shift that lonely feeling. The air is heavy with the strange smells of flowers and other plants I don't recognize. Sharp, bitter and floral all at once. I search the semi-darkness for the tree, the tree with a swing on it, mum's tree, but I can't see it anywhere. A high-pitched scream rattles through the dark velvet night. What's that? It's nothing, says Aunt Simran. Let's get you inside. I stumble up the sweeping stone steps, Aunt Simran leading the way. At the top, the front door is open and we step into a big hallway with a mosaic floor. Large table lamps give off a cosy glow, lighting up paintings of tigers and deer on the walls. That really sets the story up for us in terms of that sense of mystery and the beauty of place and the sense of memory as well, because even though Tamarind hasn't been, or not since she was a baby, um, hasn't been to this place. Uh, she still has expectations of what she will find there. Her mother's swing, for instance. Um, you you lived near the Himalayas yourself, didn't you, for the for the very beginning of your life? Is this uh, talking about an area that you lived in? Is this describing an area that was very familiar to you? Well, I, as you say, I was born close to the foothills of the Himalaya in um, northern Punjab. And we had lots of stories told to us. So in, in my family, we have a big extended family. And especially when my family first moved to the UK in the 60s, we would kind of have big family gatherings and my mum would be cooking and we'd all be sitting around my uncles and all the stories would come out. And I think, you know, that's where I kind of made this, had this image of, of the place where I was born and the place where I grew up. Um, I, I grew up on a farm and we had a grumpy camel and we also had a wild monkey called Omar who adopted our family and so in this story I kind of want there were things that I wanted to bring forward so I've, I, I have um, Omar kind of resurrected in the story as the, the monkey Hanu which was really lovely to have him in there and um, and I think the kind of whole backdrop it's almost it's kind of like a mix of um, memory and imagination so I think when you're when you're little you know and you hear all these stories I think they kind of go in and then you make them really technicolor and so I've always really been drawn to kind of the mountains and snow and um, and the Himalaya although I haven't explored them a lot um, I sort of have have um, pictures of, of the place where I was born and the place where I grew up until I was um, one and a half. Yes, the monkey, he's, he's great, isn't he? And uh, he, he's a bit of a guide um, in this story, um, helps uh, Tamarind to, to make that connection with her mother. Wanted to ask, uh, as I was reading it, I was reminded a little bit about other stories where gardens feature really, actually, we haven't even mentioned the garden, perhaps I should do that first. So uh, within uh, your story, there is a, a wild garden um, that Tamarind visits. Uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about uh, the garden and what she finds there. When Tamarind comes to the house, one of the things that happen is that the magic 
happens in the wild garden. And she's something happens to really kind of upset and unbalance her. And so she, on one of the kind of first nights, she takes off into the garden. And as I said before, the, the house is, is kind of palatial and there are gardens, very manicured gardens around the house. But then further into, into the garden, there's kind of like becomes quite wilderness-like. And that's where she discovers a magical, well, like a little sort of um, hut where magic happens and then further through the gardens being neglected and it's a wild place and she sort of finds an archway and she goes underneath the archway. Um, the archway has a statue of a goddess on the top of it and it's all really, really kind of magical and evocative and so this is where she um, meets the mysterious mountain girl and it's where the monkey leads her so there's this whole kind of other other part of the story which takes place in this magical garden mm -hmm. that's interesting when you uh, when you're a reader you often make connections with other things that you've read and gardens do feature quite a lot in uh, literature and children's literature we have the secret garden and we have tom's midnight garden and i couldn't help wondering as i was reading this whether these books had been part of your reading background i was always a very very avid reader and uh, my dad made sure we were members of the library so we always kind of had access to lots and lots of books um, and the the secret garden the kind of classical book I, I sort of loved the idea of that book but I just couldn't as a girl I just couldn't get past that first page where the ayah is described as for me not in a very inclusive way and it kind of didn't feel very inviting for me for a child of my background to kind of read that and so I, 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 I couldn't kind of get beyond it and so when I Part of the part of the sort of thinking behind um, Tamarind and Star Vista was, uh, wouldn't it be lovely for children, for all children, to kind of have a, a reinvention or a reinterpretation of a story like the uh, Secret Garden that was kind of open and um, invited all children in? And it does. And also uh, within this, we have the the figure that. Um is there in the background, uh, the, the goddess Ishtar. And of course that makes connections across cultures too, doesn't it? Tell us about Ishtar and where she comes from. Oh, I absolutely love the goddess Ishtar. Um, and you know, she's so kind of magical and mysterious. What I kind of wanted to do with this was I, I was kind of looking at um, my setting. I'm really into settings when I write. And so I thought, well, um, you know, it's going to be dark for quite a, a few of the visits that Tamarind makes to the garden. And I think it's really magical when you get away from street lights and cities, things that you notice most when you look up are the, the stars and the moon. And so if you can imagine the, the night sky around Tamarind's ancestral home is going to be a light with stars. Um, but then I kind of started to think about the first star that appears in the morning and the kind of and the last one to leave the sky at night, which we kind of know as Venus. But um, you know, in ancient kind of cultures, it was it, it's Ishtar, the star of Ishtar. And so I did some research and I found out about Ishtar, the goddess and the statues and um, all, all of the kind of mythology around her. And she's awesome. And I think, you know, when you start digging, you realise that um, those very ancient cultures came before Western cultures. And so Venus um, came after Ishtar. So she's kind of based on Ishtar. Uh, but she's like, a, a Venus is a very beautified version of Ishtar. Because if you go, um, I went to the British Museum, and I put a little note in my book, so children can go and have a look at her if, they, if they'd like to. And so She's called the Queen of the Night and um, she is um, amazing looking. She's, she's got wings um, behind her. She's got her feet are talons and they sit on two lions below her. And then to either side, she has 
owls for wisdom and then the lions for strength so um, this was who I kind of based Ishtar the sort of evening star and she's sort of uh, woven through the story in a, in a really kind of lovely way I think. Yeah I think uh, what's so interesting about her as well is that she you've mentioned that duality that she has which it seems in some of the later religions the Greek and the Roman uh, that they were kind of separated out. So you had um, like love and then you had war separately or, the, you know, the Athena and um, Aphrodite were separate goddesses. Yet somehow they're all encapsulated within this mother uh, goddess, uh, which is yeah, absolutely. absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I think and I think that also with the kind of Hindi mythology, you always kind of have like Durga. You know, she's kind of strong, uh, loving, and fierce. And I think that's exactly as you say. You know, that is what Ishtar is. She's got the talons. She's got the she's got the strength, and she's got the beauty. And this kind of actually, this kind of whole duality of her um, of kind of like male and female. Um, she she's kind of um, both genders as well which is really really fascinating yeah really interesting I think we've already heard from when you read uh, to us at the beginning of the interview just how much you do love your setting and nature um, and I you know the the visual imagery that I had as I was reading this was, was wonderful but I loved in particular your description of the storm and the monsoon you describe it as lightning flashes serpent-like lashing the walls with its electric tongue tell us a little bit about your perspective on what it feels like to be in a monsoon well i think that you know we probably we've all probably been in the situation where the weather takes over and um it was a little bit like a few years ago when we had the beast from the east here you're in that situation where the weather is not going to stop and it's the same with the monsoon. The rain is just coming down in torrents. It's plastering everything with such a force. And you feel, you feel the power of nature. You feel the power of the world. And really how um, dismissive nature is of human beings. Because nature will come and nature will do whatever it it wants to do or, or um, can do and it can be destructive and it can be beautiful and it can be a whole mixture of all of those things and I guess it's it's also um, you know the reason why ancient cultures had such strong gods and goddesses because they're, they're all very much linked to the natural world and, and to nature so standing in a in a monsoon storm is just overwhelming and actually a little story I my grand that my grandmother always used to tell um, was when um, I was growing up in India and how it was a kind of monsoon torrential monsoon rains and I toddled out to the farmyard um, to the well and I was kind of standing on the well um, being battered by the by the rain and, and, and the wind as well because it comes together and she she sort of like ran out and sort of grabbed me but uh so so kind of uh, funny really you know i i always loved that story your, your story has tamarind at the center uh but she has some cousins as well and they're, they're interesting too and her relationship with them particularly sophia i wondered if you could tell us a little bit about her she's quite a modern young woman isn't she she's got um, pink at the end of her ponytail and yeah. she's quite fierce herself <laughs> She is, yeah. So I kind of, you know, I wanted to break stereotypes a little bit as well with this story. So, um, I, and I really enjoyed writing Sophia. It's, it can be kind of like real fun to write a villain. And so she's the villain in this story. And um, so she arrives at, at the beginning and she's been away at school. She's at boarding school and she's quite sassy. Um, I, I think when she arrives, um, Tamarind is kind of hoping that she can, they can be friends because she thinks she's really cool. But Sophia isn't having any of it um, and so she's really mean to Tamarind she doesn't want her there and throughout the story um, Tamarind doesn't know why she doesn't know what she's done and also 
when Tamron arrives, she feels a little bit nervous, a bit unsure. She hasn't been to the house before. She doesn't know what people are thinking of her. And she just is kind of starting to feel a little bit at home when Sophia arrives and then knocks it all out of her and it's just kind of knocked away. And, and, and also we kind of find out as the story goes along, we kind of find out about Sophia and she is a layered character and we won't give any spoilers away, but th there always are reasons why we have to kind of understand our villains. And so there are reasons why she's behaving like that. And the reader will kind of find that out as the story progresses. Yes, indeed. So the story has this strand, not only of uh, Tamarin seeking to find out about her mother, but the story of how these characters come together as well. Actually, I haven't asked you about Tamarin's name because um, that's also quite an evocative name. And um, I think that the tree, the Tamarin tree, also is quite important in mythology too, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, the name Tamarind. I sort of, went, when I was thinking about the story, Tamarind is in Punjabi, it's Imali. Um, and so it's kind of a tree that gives beautiful leaves, it gives beautiful flowers, and then it kind of gives a seed, which is like a, a sour chutney, you know, you make a, a sour chutney from it. So um, it, it was kind of a, a, a central kind of theme, and a central motif to the book. It's uh, very kind of complex. And in India, everybody would probably have a tamarind tree in their garden, so they can make tamarind chutney. And so um, I was just sort of trying to kind of build around it. Um, um, and, and, and also the whole kind of idea of mother and then the kind of the tree, sort of like, so the two things are, are quite in, linked for Tamarind. It's a tree where her mum would swing. It's a tree where her mum, when she was pregnant, where she would kind of go and it would settle Tamarind when she was inside her mum. And so um, it, it's just kind of like a, a, another link, really. I, mean, I love the magical realism in your stories. Uh, you've told us what you what you didn't read, uh, as in the Secret Garden. I wonder what you did read that became a, a kind of inspir a literary inspiration to you. I always go back to the line, "The Witch in the Wardrobe." That was one of these stories that I absolutely loved and kind of read over and over again. And I think it was because it was an ordinary kind of situation, um, a sort of ordinary family. And then through the wardrobe, they can kind of go into an extraordinary place. Um, and I did actually have, we had a, a big Victorian wardrobe in our, in our bedroom. So I would like kind of go into the wardrobe and be looking through the coats and things. And I, I sort of, you know, I was like always searching for Narnia and I think that's the wonderful thing you know sort of imagination and children really really believe in magic and I knew and I know that I definitely believed in it at that that age and so I was always trying to find it and I always kind of had this sense that if I didn't find it that day I was going to find it another day and it just you know it was very very real to me so that was a story that I really kind of held to my heart and, and loved. Ah, oh, well, we're just talking about magic. I think there's a point at which uh, Tamarind asks her grandmother or makes a statement and says, you believe in magic, don't you? And she says, yes, because there is magic here in the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> you write it much yes. better than that. But there is magic here. She sees the magic that's around. Mm, yeah, I think I think um, kind of growing up, you know, sort of my, the stories that my grandmother used to tell me, they were sort of like full of magic. And India is a place for anyone that's travelled there. It's a place full of possibilities. And there's nothing that can't, isn't possible there, I think. And, and, and I think for children, it's kind of a wonderful... A gift to give them uh, the sort of the power of the imagination, the power of magic. And, and I think it kind of translates as hope for children because everybody, you know, in this country, we have a lot of inequality, um, children, lots of children in poverty. And I think books and stories can be a real equaliser, something that anybody can pick up. And so they can, they can take 
all of these stories and it can give them give them hope and um you know sort of the the power of kind of magic and it's just lovely for children to know that there's hope and magic out there just Binder, that is such a lovely thought to end on uh, the power of magic let's give children the gift of imagination and the power of magic is there for everyone and that's certainly what you're communicating for us through uh, the two books that we've had from you so far and we can't wait to see what will be coming next after that as well so thank you so much for joining us in the reading corner today it's been a delight having you thank you for having me it's been a pleasure chatting thanks for listening to in the reading corner with just imagine if you have enjoyed this podcast you can find many more on the podcast section of our website justimagine.co.uk plus via iTunes or SoundCloud or your usual podcast provider. Don't forget to pass the pod and recommend this fantastic free resource to your friends and colleagues.